it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey everybody and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here and this is episode number 104 of our podcast where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day and we kiss them too. Don't forget, we brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? This is dark roast bourbon. Because it is cold and rainy. Are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus all products ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. Okay, so how are you doing on this? Getting ready for Thanksgiving. It's almost Thanksgiving Eve. I'm great. How are you? We're good. We're hanging in there. Good. We are doing lots of preparations for the big meal on Thursday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Baking the pumpkin muffins for the stuffing this week. (laughs) Yeah. Doing all that stuff to get ready. It's a lot of work for one meal. It is a lot of work. We don't do as many dishes, but you know, there are the standards that must be done. The stuffing must happen. The pumpkin pie must happen. And I think the mashed potatoes must happen. It all must happen here because I'm going to cook for like three weeks all in one day and uh-huh. people are going to eat the leftovers for three weeks. <laughs> yes. I don't want to hear you don't want this stuff. You wanted it so bad. You could eat it for three weeks. That's right. That's where we're going to be. I'd be happy if it lasted for three weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I'm not cooking for three weeks, nope. man. Start cooking again in time for Christmas. Yeah, Groundhog's Day until Christmas. <laughs> so what's going on with you besides Thanksgiving stuff? Uh, a lot of spinning and weaving. Oh, yeah. Every time we're talking, you're knitting away. Yeah, I've somehow opened up the time and space to do a lot more fiber art, which is feeling really good. I'm really enjoying that. We're doing some last minute garden stuff. We haven't been able to do certain things because it's been so unseasonably warm. It's been all over the place. It has been. Yeah, we haven't even had an actual hard frost. Still trying to finalize my spring breeds. Oh, yeah. I kind of know, but... Is it a secret? It's a secret. It's a secret until we don't make it a secret anymore, you know? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The holidays are upon us. Mm Mm-hmm. This is the time for togetherness and lots and lots of wine. (laughs) (laughs) We'll leave it at that. Yep. So if you're listening to the show and you're loving it, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button because every subscribe helps us grow immensely and we love it. Thank you so much to our most recent reviewers. We just love when we get these reviews. It makes our day. If you're looking for other ways to help support the podcast, you can share your favorite episode on social media. You can tell a chicken-loving friend or three. Or four or five. You can visit our Etsy shop. Check out the items we have listed. It's getting close to Christmas, so you might want to start ordering holiday gifts for your favorite chicken person. Those mugs are great. A mug would be great. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Gigantic thank you to our most recent patrons. Thank you. And the other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our show notes, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah? Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then, yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the November box, I absolutely love that glass rooster cutting board and the woven chicken tea towel. I adore those Santa chicken hats and scarves, and I cannot wait to hang those chicken ornaments up on my chicken tree. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order, and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. 
Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Time for the Breed Spotlight, yeah! What's that one? I was marching. Is this early America again? <laughs> your early America. I'm starting to recognize which one is your early America. Yes. So this week's Breed Spotlight, let's take a little swizzle whizzle. Yeah. I couldn't remember which one of us came up with this idea. You. It was me. And so if you do not like this idea, let us know <laughs> and we will not repeat. We're going crazy. Because it's our Thanksgiving special. And we are spotlighting the Jersey Buff Turkey. We're going to cross the poultry line. <laughs> We're going to cross the line. <laughs> We're heading over from chicken to turkey this one time Look because it's Thanksgiving. Tell us if you like it or you don't like it. Because if you like it, you know, we might do more turkeys in the future. If you don't, we're going straight back to the chicken. But just for Thanksgiving, we thought we would yeah. highlight a heritage breed turkey. Because there are a lot of people out there that do cross poultry lines. Absolutely. It's a not well-kept secret that I think turkey babies are some of the cutest things ever. They I love turkey cute. poults. So the Jersey Buff Turkey is a rare heritage breed turkey that is actually a recreation of an earlier turkey breed known as the Buff that went extinct in the early 20th century. So it re-emerged. Kinda. As the Jersey Buff. The Jersey Buff. Buff, yeah. The Buff was a beautiful heritage breed that was popular right here in the Mid-Atlantic in early America. We're going to tell you the story of both as far as we know it. The Jersey Buff is a distinct breed, and it is currently found in the watch category of the Livestock Conservancy's Conservation Priority List. Now, I should mention that it's grouped in with a bunch of other turkey breeds that are distinct breeds, but are not APA recognized. Right. And so when you take the whole group together, they're on the watch list. In reality, it's really hard to find Jersey Buff turkeys. It is. Our upcoming guest really was having a really tough time yes. finding one. So just a couple of quick notes about turkeys. If you're just like us chicken people, turkeys are native to the Americas. So they were here. Exactly. They didn't get brought in by somebody on right. a ship. They've always been here. Yes. The most common strain of wild turkey we have probably came north from Mexico. Now, at one point, there had been an indigenous turkey. It was the California turkey. Okay. But it went extinct about 10,000 years ago. Archaeologists actually know a fair bit about it because their bones were robust and mm -hmm. they were perfectly preserved in the La Brea tar pits. Right. A lot of scientists theorize that the California turkey went extinct due to climate change, I guess the Ice Age. Yep. And some overhunting by prehistoric people. Shocker. The University of Colorado Boulder has a great article on early turkeys. I linked this in our show notes. All turkey breeds in the world originated here in North and Central America and were taken from here to Europe that's and elsewhere. Of, that's one of the takeaways from all of this is mm -hmm. this is one of the only few things that are native to where we are. That and llamas and alpacas? Yeah. They weren't brought over by anybody. Right. I love that. Turkeys belong to the native people. Right. Our European people came here. And adopted them. And actually, the funny thing is, we came back to the turkeys because our families are all from Europe where they had turkeys borrowed from the U.S. Yeah. I like it. It's a big circle. It is. It's a turkey circle. It's a circle of life. Interestingly enough, I read somewhere that turkeys prefer round pens. Wow. They're more comfortable in round enclosures. I just thought that was fascinating. So turkeys were also quite popular in England for a few hundred years. Mm -hmm. And they did have the buff turkey there. They were known as fawns for their fawn coloration. Right. Guess who was a fan of fawn <laughs> turkeys? <laughs> is it Mr. Lewis Wright? It is Mr. Lewis Wright, yes. But he did note that even then, in the late 1880s, early 1900s, the fawns were dying out there too. Yeah. The buff turkey was once included in the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection. There is a standard listed for them in my 1891 edition. Okay. But they had been dropped by 1915 and they went extinct soon after. Poor turkeys. I know. It's always sad. 
The original Buff was the foundation breed for the very popular Bourbon Red Turkey. Which we're going to hear again yeah. later from our guests. When I was doing this on. research, I didn't know that, but yeah. So the Buffs and the Jersey Buffs are very pretty turkeys. The feathers are this rich golden red. They have some lighter shading on their wings and tails. Right. And they have a few other lighter colored spots. I also read that their color will lighten with age with each molt. Okay. So interesting. Turkeys have their own form of waddle. They serve the same purpose in turkeys that they do in chickens. Yeah, to cool the body down. Right. I guess they also broadcast sexual maturity. And then turkeys have that nifty thing called a snood. Yes, yeah, some of them do, some of them don't. Right, and they can be like really long or can be really short. Yeah. Jersey buffs do have a snood, both sexes. On the males, as they age, they can get like five inches long. So the buff turkey was not one of the larger turkey breeds, and the Jersey buff is not either. Although I look at turkeys, and I think even the small ones are like big. Yes. Because of their feathering. Their feather patterns are so different than chickens. They have the big, wide fan in the back, most of them. I mean, that just gives them a bigger appearance no matter what. A male turkey looks to me like it's going to be 40 pounds. You know, if they're putting on their display. It's the feather patterns. This is the standard from 1891. It called for disqualification of any buff tom that was under 18 pounds and any buff hens that were under 12 pounds. These are the minimum weights listed. Right. That's a lot bigger even than, you know, a seven pound, eight pound roux. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it's big. The ideal standard for the buff turkey in 1891 was 27 pounds for a mature tom and 18 for a mature hen. That's big. That's an armful of bird right there. Yeah, you're not going to be carrying the big turkey tom around the yard. No. Today, though, the Jersey buffs weigh in a bit smaller. From what I gathered, toms are around 20 pounds tops, and the hens are about 10 to 12 pounds. Right. And that takes us into the creation of the Jersey buff. I'm sad to say goodbye to the buff. Yeah. It pains me when something goes extinct. Did John Bon Jovi have anything to do with the Jersey buff? Maybe. (laughs) Call him up and ask him. (laughs) And before we get too in-depth about the development of the Jersey buff, I just want to mention two extremely useful articles, link in the show notes. The first was on a breeder's website, Porter's Rare Heritage Turkeys. They have a reproduction of an article about Jersey buffs from a 1952 issue of Turkey World Magazine. Yeah. There's also a wonderful article in the June-July 2009 issue of Backyard Poultry Magazine. It was written by Christina Allen, and it's a very thoughtful look at the Jersey buff Breeding them as a small conservation flock and the things she's learned are important to keeping them happy is actually a very, very nice article if you're interested in keeping turkeys. turkeys are going to be a little bit different in poultry keeping than chickens. Yeah, yeah. Every kind of animal that you cross over with is going to give you a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. So if you're used to chickens and then you want to get into turkeys, you're going to have to learn a whole new set of ways to take care of this animal. Absolutely. Just as in with geese even. So if, if you pass that poultry line and go over to geese, their body shapes are different. Everything is different. Their different housing. diseases. Yeah, different diseases are something you really need to look into. Yeah, so they are beautiful in their own right. If that's something that you want to do, just know that it's going to take a little bit more research. You're going to need a little different housing. Yeah. We talk about the roost a little while later, but yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. So in 1939, the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station in Millville, New Jersey, began a breeding program that was focused on producing a small turkey that would be appropriate for small family farms. Okay. They were trying to get lower weights than commercial production turkeys were hitting, and they wanted it to be buff colored, I think. Make it more appealing. Yeah. They also wanted it to be fast maturing. Now, this I thought was really interesting. One of the reasons behind this project was the fact that the production turkeys were too big for the average American kitchen. They grew them too big. Right. They wouldn't fit in the oven. Well, that's it. Exactly. In many cases, the turkeys were, well, they were also too expensive. Yeah. I mean, coming out of the depression, they were too expensive for a lot of people. But you're right. The ovens were not big enough. The ice boxes were also small. And so you ended up with a family struggling to find a place to store the Thanksgiving and or Christmas leftovers until they could be made into stock or something like that. They literally did not have a place to put a bird this big. Because at that time, and even now, you should use every part that you can. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean. That's what my mom always did. Yeah. So to reinvent this buff turkey, they crossed Spanish black with bourbon red turkeys. They bred the offspring back to the bourbon reds. Okay. And then they selected the buff offspring from that mixing. So by the third generation, they had homozygous buff turkeys that were breeding true. But they spent a few more generations back breeding to the bourbon reds and selecting for homozygous buff birds before they felt like they had achieved their goal of a buff bird that was breeding true. 
But now today, this bird is very difficult to find. Yes, it is. And it's like kind of gone back. Yeah, uh, it sad. really is very, very hard to find. The Livestock Conservancy notes that the original buff was foundation stock for the bourbon red. And because the bourbon red was used to create the Jersey buff, they share a common red gene. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting that those original genetics do live on. Yeah. I mean, one is definitely deeper of a brown red. Yes. And one's more of a buff red. Yes. But they share a gene, which is a great way to bring the breed back by using the same two turkeys. It makes a lot of sense. I like that they were using the heritage breeds. And the bourbon red turkeys are just absolutely beautiful, too. Yeah. Really they have pretty. the deep brown, the reddish brown with mm-hmm. the white. Yeah. I mean, they are very pretty. Let's get into turkey eggs. Turkey eggs are large. And they're very pretty. And they don't lay them very often. No. You're not going to be having a turkey to lay eggs to eat breakfast and things like that. The interesting thing there to me, and it makes perfect sense, turkeys were not selected for egg laying. No. Chickens were selected for egg laying. And when you get into the Mediterranean breeds, they were heavily selected for egg laying. Yes. Jersey buff hens lay cream to light brown speckled eggs. Obviously, it's a large egg. They, the Jersey Buffs, are considered good layers amongst the turkeys. And we checked with Allison and she did tell us their Jersey Buff did lay 12 eggs in a year, which is very good. Yes, it really is good. She also confirmed that the hens do go broody. Mm -hmm. Now, they never hatched any eggs, but I've read that the Jersey Buffs make very good mothers. I also read that some Jersey Buff hens will raise two clutches a year if they can, which means potentially you could get two dozen eggs from a Jersey Buff hen which is a lot of eggs from a turkey. It is. Allison said she had never seen her Jersey buff do that Mm -hmm. over there. Yeah. But it might be for a young Jersey buff turkey. Maybe a young one. Yeah. So turkey poults, I've heard this and read this in numerous places. Turkey poults can be a little fragile in their first couple weeks of life. And you need to make sure that they're warm, safe, not too stressed, and they have easy access to high quality feed and water. The same as you would with your chickens. Absolutely. I also read that you want to keep your moms and babies somewhere that they're safe from attacks by other turkeys. Oh. Yeah. You have to watch turkeys going after each other. Turkey poults, in my opinion, are so cute. I love them. I mean, all baby animals are adorable. Yes, they are. Let's put that out there. But absolutely are. But for some reason. Our hearts with the poultry here, they're all going to be cute. These (sighs) chicks of any kind of poultry are adorable. There's a rural king not too far from me, and they will have turkey poults I mean, in stock. the mill, a lot of places do have turkey poults, so they're cute to see. My branch of the mill doesn't have them that often. Really? Yeah. The so. Bel Air Mill always has like pheasants and everything, I they, feel they, like. Yeah, they get the, the end of the season. The, yeah. Yes. Yep, they do. Yeah. And turkeys. A lot of turkeys. Yes. Now, the Jersey Buffs have a reputation for being an especially gentle breed and making good pets, especially if they're handled regularly and given a chance to bond with their people. The same as chickens. Exactly. Now, if you're interested in adding turkeys to your flock. Our old favorite, McMurray Hatchery. They carry several heritage breeds of turkey poult. Yeah. So it's very easy if you want to make the transition. You will need to do different care, though. Just know this. Right. Yeah. You want to look into it first. Turkeys, I think, could be a really enriching addition if for Do a hobby flock. you see them in your flock? Yes, I could see them in my <laughs> flock. Will I? I don't know. And the reason for that is with only four acres yeah. and already having sheep and myriad chickens, I don't know. I joke with Pete about it. I went to Tom. <laughs> anyway, McMurray carries several heritage breeds. Now, if you're looking specifically for the Jersey Buffs, I would go to the Livestock Conservancy's breeder directory. Yeah, check it out and see if there's some breeders near you that might have them. They're going to be tough to find. Yes. Now, interestingly enough, I found a couple of buff turkey breeders in the UK. So if you're over there. Google's your friend. See what you can find. (laughs) If you have some, share some pictures of your turkeys with us on Instagram. We'll give you a story. Absolutely. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Amazon.com or Nestera.us. Use our code CWTCLP10 for 10% off. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, take a look at Roosty's store on Amazon.com. We've personally tested their products and we're huge fans. They have their famous nesting pads, those fantastic chick water and feeder kits, do-it-yourself port feeder kits, 
What are a nipple and what are our cup kits? And you don't even need to drive to the stores. They're all available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Visit Amazon.com and check out the Roosties range or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so now we're going to move on to main topic. Yeah. Yeah. This week's main topic, we are talking with Allison Bodie of the National Colonial Farm. Enjoy. Allison is the livestock manager at the National Colonial Farm in Piscataway Park, yes, which is in Prince George's County, Maryland. In Akakeek, yes. In Akakeek <laughs> Park, right. Essentially, if you visit Mount Vernon across the Potomac River, you can see Akakeek Park. They're it, neighbors of each other. Yeah, it's a really, really fantastic place. If you're in the Maryland, D.C. area and you haven't visited, you want to go. When Christy and I visited, it was for our 4th of July. So it was June. Okay. It was, yeah, the end of June. You had a pair of Jersey buff turkeys there. We had never seen these turkeys before. We became fascinated with them. We just did a breed spotlight about them. And we are talking to Allison more about the practical aspects of turkey keeping and about the National Colonial Park, which is fascinating. Allison, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. We're very glad to have you. How are you doing today? I'm good. It's a rainy day. I've been out getting very wet this morning, so I'm glad <laughs> to come inside. <laughs> horrible out there. It's really bad. We have the remnants of Hurricane Nicole coming up through the East Coast today. So yeah, our chickens over here are not happy campers. Not a good day. So you have lots of livestock on the farm that we want to talk about. But first, could you give our listeners a little bit of your background and tell everyone a bit about the awesomeness that is the National Colonial Farm? So the National Colonial Farm is just a small part of Piscataway Park. And I work for the Akakeek Foundation, which manages part of Piscataway Park. So Piscataway Park covers the Potomac waterfront all the way from Fort Washington down to Marshall Hall and is a very large park. And we steward about 200 acres of it, a small portion. But we are part of the national park system. The colonial farm is a small part of what we do, but it was established to kind of portray what a middling colonial family would live like, as opposed kind of in juxtaposition of Mount Vernon across the river. Mm -hmm. So, of course, most of the colonial houses and structures that are left are from people like George Washington, but that is not the way that most people lived. This land first belonged to the indigenous peoples, the Piscataway people mm -hmm. lived here first. And then, of course, European settlers came in, but there have been people living on this land for centuries. And so we're kind of trying to depict how the people shaped that land and used that land, you know, what people found to do here. So the colonial farm is a small part of that. We have some structures that were not original to this property. We have a house that was built circa 1770 and was moved here piece by piece. That's Laurel Branch. So that is our colonial house. We also have a colonial tobacco barn because we know that in the mid-Atlantic region, tobacco farming was you know, the main cash crop, the main way that they lived. And so we recognize that the labor of enslaved people was used to make a profit for these farmers. And so we try to tell the story from different perspectives. You know, we have Piscataway cultural exhibitions, and we try to talk about courageous conversations from the viewpoint of enslaved people who had been working here on the farm and also of the, the European colonists who came here and tried to make a living. So in support of that, we do have various breeds of heritage livestock the types of livestock that they would have kept on a farm because really everybody had livestock. It was just mm -hmm. the way it was. We have American milking Devon cattle, and I did indeed milk the cow in the rain this morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have Osaball Island hogs. We have hog island sheep. We have mottled Java chickens. And right now we have Jersey buff and bourbon red turkeys. <gasps> we try to conserve breeds that are endangered. So most of our breeds are critically endangered. And we try to use them for educational purposes, which is usually why I milk for educational purposes, but there was nobody here to see that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and we also try to kind of model sustainable agriculture. So we do things like rotational grazing and different things like that. So that's kind of what we do here at Piscataway Park. My background, I was a 4 -er. I grew up on a tobacco farm in Southern Maryland in Charleston. Oh. And so we always had livestock from the time I can remember. We raised hogs and cattle. But when I joined 4-H at age 10, I wanted to raise sheep. And my father <laughs> thought this was like the dumbest idea he'd ever heard. <laughs> 
you know, he knew all about cattle and hogs. He didn't know the first thing about sheep, but lo and behold, I raised sheep. And so I've pretty much been raising sheep ever since. And so currently I have a small farm in Nanjamoy, Maryland, which is south of where I am here. And we have all kinds of poultry and sheep and goats and donkeys um, and things like that. So um, what kind of sheep do you have? My sheep are Lincolns. My daughter has Finns. But my daughter is away at college. So actually, I have Lincoln's and Finns. You have Lincoln's and Finns. Because she's not home. <laughs> well, those are two gorgeous, gorgeous breeds. We're going to segue into poultry because we are coffee with yeah, the chicken I- ladies. So just very, very quickly, since this is our Thanksgiving episode, I'm just curious about this. Has there been any kind of archaeological excavation done on the park to learn more about the Piscataway people that were there? There has been some excavation done. A lot of Piscataway artifacts have been unearthed. There was actually a lot of controversy earlier in the 20th century, like mid-century. Alice Ferguson was a woman who who owned some property, and she dug up a lot of artifacts and kind of gave them away. And so there's really some controversy about that because the Piscataway people are still here. The Piscataway mm-hmm. people still meet here on our property. This is still their homeland. They come here for ceremonial purposes. And so just kind of trying to untangle centuries of mistreatment, I guess, yeah. of, of those people who were here first has been difficult, but we do have tribal partners. We have partners who come and help to kind of guide us. And there's still a lot of archaeologically sensitive areas here in the park. So we're not allowed to plow or dig or anything like that because those areas are still there waiting to be excavated and explored. Of course, the land has been used for farming for years and years, so it has been plowed. But right now, you know, it's considered archaeologically sensitive. So we try to leave it alone. The whole park is a fascinating resource. I wish more people knew about it because what you're doing there is really fascinating. No, thank you. I wanted to ask a question about the Javas. When we came in June, you were trying to get the hatching egg. So I kind of wanted to get an update on how many do you have? How's it going? And how are they doing on the farm? Well, that experiment didn't go exactly as we planned. We had Icelandic chickens here on the farm, which we had had for a number of years. They're fine chickens, but they really were not very representative of the time period we were trying to describe. So we decided to move to model Javas, which fit our mission in a couple of ways. They're a pretty old breed and pretty multi-purpose, can forage for themselves, things like that. And the second oldest breed in America, this is what they're considered. And also the Javas are critically endangered. So we try to preserve the critically endangered breeds. So that's why we went with model Javas. It took us a while to find, we couldn't find any live birds like chicks or hens or anything. I Um, remember you were going to get hatching eggs. Yeah, so we got hatching eggs. Um, One of my colleagues drove to Richmond, actually, and picked up two dozen hatching eggs. And we set them all in the incubator. And in the end, we ended up with nine surviving chicks, which is not a very good hatch rate. More than that hatched. I don't remember the exact number, but they didn't survive the hatch very well. They would pip and not get out. They would be alive in the egg and never pip. There was only one egg that wasn't fertile. The rest of them were very well formed, but just didn't hatch. So they seem to have a very thick membrane. And I wonder if that may have been part of the problem. If I hatch again, I'm going to play a little with the um, humidity, see if that will help a little bit. I don't really know exactly what the problem was with our hatch, but we ended up with nine chicks. I would say now that you have the Javas, you can maybe use a broody. Yeah, right. We can try to put the eggs under a broody mom. What's your cockerel to pullet ratio? So of the ones we hatched, we had five cockerels and four pullets, which is about (laughs) what you would expect. Since then, we have had someone who donated to us one hen and two roosters. And just this week, I don't know if you remember our chicken coop over there, but our our chicken coop, the roof was leaking and there were rotten spots in the roof. So my assistant took off the roof this week and we moved those Javas into another coop that we had put up for them and something ate one. Oh, no. (laughs) So now they're all in a little cage where they're not too happy, but at least they're alive until we get the roof back on that chicken cage. So right now we have four of our cockerels and four of our pullets. 
we're hoping that by next week, maybe he'll get the roof back on the chicken coop and then we can kind of separate out some roosters, maybe pick our best, whichever is the best to meet the standard and put that with the hens. And then by spring, we hope to have eggs again and we can set our eggs and hatch and do things like play around with the humidity. Once we have our own eggs and we don't have to drive to Richmond to get them, it will be right. easier to do what we want to do. So, yeah. So we knew you were getting a new Tom to go along with your Jersey buff hen, but you said you got bourbon reds as well. So we couldn't find a Jersey buff Tom. The new Tom we got is a bourbon red. Oh, um, okay. I searched and searched and could not find a Jersey buff Tom anywhere. Oh. I couldn't find a Jersey buff at all. When our Tom died, and he was very old. I'm reasonably certain he just plain died of old age. I'm so glad that we got to meet him in June. He was, <laughs> he was very welcoming. Very and, yeah. unusual looking turkey. So yeah, pretty. He was calling us over, yeah. over and over and over. <laughs> it was so nice to actually meet him. So he was pretty old. As far as I can tell, he was somewhere between eight and 10 years old. Wow. He lived a nice long life. He lived a nice long life. And one day when I came here, he was just gone. But then his hen, who is probably by most accounts slightly younger, but not what you would call young, she was fine as long as his body was in there with her. But once I took him out, she just kind of went berserk. Oh, no. And, and started like pacing around and flying at the cage because she was lonely. So I had to go out and buy another turkey just because I didn't <laughs> want to lose her, too. The turkey that I could find immediately nearby was a bourbon red hen. So for the summer, we mostly had the Jersey buff hen and the bourbon red hen, and they have been in a chicken tractor just grazing around in the fields. They, nice. they love the fresh grass. So I think when we were there in June, she was sitting on an egg that you said probably was sitting there for like 10 years yeah. that was never going to have. <laughs> right. she, yeah, she sat on eggs until I finally took them away from her because I was <laughs> I started to worry about her health. She'd been setting for a long, long time. You're like, <laughs> yeah. you've sat enough. Is that common with the Jersey buff hens? Do they go broody pretty they reliably? Seem, they seem to brood a lot. Yes, they seem very broody. I read that Jersey buff hens are good layers. What does that mean for a turkey? Well, turkeys in general are not good layers. So <laughs> I think she probably laid roughly a dozen eggs in the spring. Okay. My turkeys at home are standard bronze. And I'm lucky if they lay six or eight eggs. I read that Jersey buff hens sometimes go broody more than once a year, so they would produce two clutches. I did not experience that. Okay. But I only ever had that one oldish hen and one old tom. So here in the park, we have had more Jersey buffs in previous years, but not when I was here. So, so you got the bourbon red to keep her company. And we do know that the Jersey buff and the bourbon red share that red gene. So, so that's, that's what of... I'm hoping. Our Jersey buffs were not very buff. If you remember, they were kind of on the white side for, yes. for Jersey buffs. So I'm kind of hoping that if my Jersey buff hen is still viable and I can breed her to the bourbon red, that maybe I can bring back more of that buff color mm -hmm. that we would be looking for. So that's what I'm hoping. That would be gorgeous. And they're getting along fine and in love. So I just have the two hens out in the tractor and I've got the new Tom just this past weekend. He just came okay. here this past weekend. So he is not with them right now. He's in isolation in the barn. He has a whole cow stall to himself right now. And every time somebody walks into the barn, he just puffs himself up huge. He's beautiful, a huge, beautiful turkey. So the man I got him from had a granddaughter who told me his name was Nate. He likes little kids, which is good when we're here in a public park. So I invite the kids in and they gobble at him and he gobbles back. And Oh, that's cute. That's oh, my nice. goodness. <laughs> it's Thanksgiving. We really know the purpose of a turkey in general. But breeds like the bourbon red and the Jersey buff, do they make good pets for somebody with a small farm that wants to have a turkey breed? I think so. I think that your biggest concern is, again, predators. You can't just have them free ranging in your yard unless you want them to be eaten. But I think they're generally not aggressive. They puff themselves up, but they don't really attack. They just puff up. And um, I think they do make good pets. I would say that Nate, the Jersey buff in my barn right now, has soulful eyes. If you look at him, you know that he is thinking something. Some birds just look like they're not really thinking a whole lot. But um, I think that this particular Tom really looks like he has some thoughts going on in his head. They're just really interesting to watch, like the color change on their head. You know, he can change from blue to red to kind of purple and blue and red again. I tell everybody it's kind of like a mood ring. You know, his head is changing colors <laughs> depending on his mood. 
but I haven't really figured out which color means which mood. You know, I, mm-hmm. I think it's something that you could sit and really just engross yourself in trying to figure out what does it mean when his head turns kind of purple? I don't know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so in your experience, the poultry together, chickens and turkeys, can they live and coincide together and be happy? Or is there some turmoil between the two? I have been taught forever that you don't keep turkeys and chickens together because of the threat of blackhead. So Mm -hmm. the chickens can carry blackhead and they live with it. But if the turkeys get it, their heads turn black and they die. So here at the farm, the chickens and the turkeys were living side by side for a long time. Mm -hmm. And they seemed okay with that. They didn't have any disease problem. But my plan now is to put the turkeys in a separate enclosure, not quite so close to the chickens. Because I do know people who have kept their chickens and turkeys together, and then all of a sudden the turkeys start dying. Is there a specification for housing that's different than chickens for turkeys? So it needs to be bigger, basically. I'm This tom turkey I've got is big. He's probably three or four times the size of your average chicken. So they need a bigger house. A lot of those pre-made coops that you buy, you know, the ones that you put together, the house part is really not big enough to house turkeys. They have to have a bigger house, a a bigger roost, a a stronger roost because they're heavy. These are much heavier birds. So it's got to be a a pretty lower roost and lower. Some turkeys do fly, but most of our domestic turkeys are too heavy to really get much flight. So, okay. We have a lot of people that may be playing with the idea of adding turkeys into their flock or creating a second flock with turkeys Mm -hmm. along with the poultry. So it's good to know, you know, like it might not be a great idea to put everybody together in one spot. Making two separate flocks would be the way to go. I really love the heritage breed turkeys. You know, a lot of the modern turkeys, like the turkeys we buy at the grocery store at Thanksgiving, the ones that are 37 cents a pound or whatever, Those turkeys can't breed naturally because we have bred them to have such huge breasts. You know, we want, Mm -hmm. we want white meat. We want breast. You know, you can buy turkey breast as opposed to a whole turkey. So the heritage breeds are much more agile. They can move around on their own. They're not so heavy that they topple over. They can breed naturally. They can be broody and set on their eggs. That's some of the characteristics that we have bred out of our modern industrial turkeys. You know, they can't do those things. It's so important to preserve the heritage breed turkeys that are out there and keep them going just as much as the heritage breed chickens out there. And there are a lot of really cool breeds of turkey. People think turkey, they kind of have, you know, a mindset, but turkeys come in in a variety of colors and patterns. So what are your favorite heritage breeds? Well, I really like this bourbon red that I've got in the barn. He is gorgeous. (laughs) Um, (laughs) At home, I have standard bronze. They're very iridescent. They're very shiny. Probably a little more, a little closer aligned to the native turkeys that were here, say, in colonial times. I mean, turkeys are really the livestock that were indigenous. There were turkeys living here in the wild. And I think the bronzes kind of capture that a little better than some of the other breeds. I like royal palm. I I like a lot of turkeys. I don't like the ones that are just all white because that seems so boring. (laughs) We know that's a production thing. I want to very quickly, I want to come back to the heritage breeds, but I want to very quickly mention this about the blackhead disease. Because a lot of our people are just chicken people. I always heard the same thing as you, Allison, that you did not run your turkeys and your chickens together because of blackhead disease. I'm a 4-H'er from way back too. I think that was like the common farm knowledge. So if you've never heard of blackhead disease, it is a protozoa that is carried in roundworms. So if your chickens have the protozoa present and the roundworms are present in the chicken poop, then the turkeys can pick it up. So I thought it was fascinating that a bird like the Jersey buff that is really hard to get your hands on is on the watch list, for the Livestock Conservancy's conservation priority list. So I read into that a little more. It looks like there's a bunch of non-APA recognized colors, including the Jersey buff. There's a lavender. There's some others that I can't remember. And they're all grouped into one category. It's like they're distinct breeds, but they're not APA accepted anymore. And so they're all sort of under the watch list. But it looks like when you get down to the individual colors, they're not very readily available. You have to hunt for them. Right. Yes. And that's part of the problem. So I've got a guy who's kind of on the lookout at shows for me to look for Jersey buffs, but because they're not APA recognized, they're not going to be at your standard poultry shows. You're not going to find them there. So it's hard to connect with whoever might have them. Yeah. 
And also because they're not standardized, people are kind of experimenting with them. So I think when we got our original Jersey Buffs, there was a breeder who was kind of experimenting with color and working on breeding things to make Jersey Buffs. I think that all of that makes it more difficult to get a turkey that is a Jersey Buff. Yeah. I mean, if you get a copy of the 1874 Standard of Perfection, you can see what the original Buff had, but that doesn't necessarily (laughs) apply to this bird with different genetics. Yeah. What kind of fun stuff do you have going on right now at the Colonial Farm? Our big event is Winter's Eve, which is December 3rd, is a Saturday in the evening. And that's kind of our end of season event. So the farm will be decked out in kind of the colonial version of Christmas. And so we'll have wreaths and greenery and things like that. We'll do hay rides, have the hay wagon out. I think they're going to dip candles, some things like that. The barn will be decked out in lights because technically the barn is separate from the colonial site. So Mm -hmm. the barn will have lights and Christmas decorations and we'll have some animals in the barn so that the people can ride the hay wagon up and get off and come in the barn and see our animals. Our animals right now are in the process of making their Christmas lists. So they're writing their letters to Santa and they'll have their letters to Santa posted there and we'll have stockings there that people can make donations so that we can hope to purchase some of the things that we still need for our heritage breeds. Anyone who's listening to this, how can they help you guys out over there? You can go to our website, which is akakeek.org. That's A-C-C-O-K-E-E-K. There is a place there that you can donate and we are a nonprofit. We appreciate donations. We can always put those to good use. We like it when people come to visit us. It's free. You can come to the park for free. It just helps to affirm that what we're doing is valuable to someone other than us. If people come and visit and stop to talk, I love to invite people into the barn. So we loved it. We had fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we, we like people to come to our events. So the events, we do generally charge a small fee for events. Winter's Eve is kind of the last one. And then we'll take the winter off. And then our next big event will be lattes with lambs, which is in the spring. In April, we have lattes with lambs. By then our lambs will be born. Last year, I hatched chicks. We had chicks hatching at that event. And we have our lambs and our calves. And, you know, it's just kind of a spring event. I'll have links to your website and the event page and everything else on our show notes so people can get to them easily. Lattes with lambs, you know that is right up my alley. (laughs) So how many breeding hog island ewes do you have right now? I think we bred 11. Last year, we had 13 lambs that survived. I think we had one that didn't survive. So I think that might have been nine ewes last year. So hopefully Mm -hmm. this year we'll have a few more lambs. We should have calves by then. We bred 10 cows this year. Oh, wow. So we should have calves and we set as many eggs as we can get in the incubator and try to have some chicks that are already hatched and some chicks that are actually hatching the day Mm -hmm. of the event because people get really fascinated to come and watch chicks. I mean, sometimes it's like watching paint dry or something because they don't make, they don't seem to make much progress. But then when one finally pops out, it's like a major celebration. So it's pretty amazing to watch that. Yeah. We know you're going to do the Java conservation program. Are you going to stick with the Icelandics too? Or are there any other chicken breeds you might expand to? So we sold the last of our Icelandics. We don't have Icelandics anymore. Um, We would like to get the different varieties of Javas. So right now all we have is modeled because that's what we could get our hands on. Those are our favorite. (laughs) They're so beautiful. They are very pretty. But we would also like to get some black Javas. And I think by spring it will be easier for me to get my hands on some black Javas because again, they're very iridescent. They've got that shiny green green black with the shiny green. Yeah. Um, So I would like to also have black Javas and I would like to have Auburn Javas, which those are not recognized, but I understand that they're just really beautiful and are the basis for a lot of other breeds that we're familiar with. Including the Bird Island Red. Yeah. Reds. Yeah. So I would really like to get my hands on some Auburn Javas. And then again, if we want to keep our lines, our Java lines straight, then I have to have housing for each of those, which currently I only have two sides to the chicken coop. So I have to plan accordingly to go with the housing that I have. Well, so if everybody's listening, could donate a few dollars to help out. (laughs) Absolutely. We could get you some money to build up these chicken coops for the colonial farm. That would be amazing. My understanding is that there used to be a historical site in Illinois. I have seen that. Yes. And they used to be like the biggest breeders of Java in the country and they stopped breeding them. 
and the breed just tanked into the critically endangered category. So listeners, Allison and her staff are trying very, very hard to get this conservation program going. Go donate a little bit, please. If a bunch of you do a dollar or two, it makes a big difference. Or if you happen to have Java stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) So Allison, thank you so, so much for taking the time this afternoon to talk to us all about the Colonial Farm, about the turkeys, about the heritage breeds. It's been fascinating. We loved coming to visit you in June. We're actually coming again. Yeah. Well, by the time this airs, we'll have already been. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. You're welcome. I like to talk about chickens. (laughs) Well, then we'll have you back one again. (laughs) Happy Thanksgiving. We just want to thank Allison one more time for coming on and spending some time with us for our Thanksgiving episode, Talking Turkey and Java. It was a lot of fun. If you are anywhere near the National Colonial Farm at Piscataway Park, it's a wonderful place to visit. Yes. Go check them out. And December 3rd, they have their Winter's Eve, which is going to be a great event. So if you're near, check it out. We might be there. We might be there. Mm -hmm. Come see us. Okay, so let's move on to cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. So this month we're doing Holly Ann's Thanksgiving recipes. Yeah. And Holly says that her Thanksgiving is not without fried oysters. My mom also made oyster stuffing. I do not like oysters myself. I only like them in certain preparations. But a lot of people, especially in the Mid-Atlantic and in New England, like fried oysters. Well, this is oyster season. Yeah. So I think that really played into it. Yeah. And how else are you going to get out of those oyster shells for your chickens? (laughs) Do you remember this? In my neighborhood, when we were kids, some of the driveways were actually paved with oyster shells. Yeah. Like they would put down the big shells and drive over them until they were crushed. That's an interesting thing. I've told younger people about that and they were like, look at me like I had two heads. What? Yeah. That's what happens when you grow up in a water community. Well, oyster shells were used for every pathway anywhere. Yeah. There were so many of them that they would just put them down for a pathway. So fried oysters. I know plenty of people who love raw oysters. I am not in that camp. Joe is one of them. Does he like them? Yeah. Okay. What you want for this recipe is about two dozen shucked oysters. Shucking oysters is a skill. If you don't know how to wield that knife or you don't have that knife. And you want to keep your thumb. Just buy shucked oysters. (laughs) Yeah, Seriously. (laughs) I learned to shuck oysters when I was a kid, but gosh darn. Yeah. It's a skill. You could take off a finger. You really could. So you want some oil for frying. You do not have to deep fry these. I just fry them in a pan. Yeah. Peanut oil is the traditional oil for frying Mm -hmm. oysters. You want some buttermilk or you can make your own buttermilk with a teaspoon of lemon juice in some oat milk or something. I use oat milk. And then you need garlic powder and our old favorite, Old Bay. Yeah, you can also use paprika. Hush, woman, you don't say that around here. Well, if you're doing this as an early American recipe before Old Bay. There was no before Old Bay. We got to use it. There was no before Old Bay. (laughs) Time did not exist before Old Bay. Hot sauce if you're into that. And then you want cornmeal and flour mixed together and some salt and pepper in there. Easy peasy. Yeah. So you start by mixing the buttermilk, the egg garlic powder, paprika, and your optional hot sauce. Mix it all together. I am going to take the hot sauce out. Uh, Yeah, I'm not leaving that in there either. (laughs) Yeah. And then in another bowl, you're going to put all your dry ingredients and your salt and pepper. So you add the oysters to that mixture and then you let it soak. Yeah. You're going to remove them and let the excess buttermilk drip off. You're going to dredge them through the cornmeal mixture Mm -hmm. and then you're going to fry them. Yep. That's it. And then you're going to add them to your Thanksgiving table or appetizer for before Thanksgiving. If like us, you aren't a meat eater, the fried oysters are actually a nice thing to serve. Or they could be an appetizer or they could go into your three weeks worth of leftovers. <laughs> Some oyster Except for I don't sandwiches. eat oysters. <laughs> <laughs> into my three weeks worth of leftovers. If you need to make this gluten and dairy free, again, you can do dairy free buttermilk. Cornmeal is gluten free. You can just use a gluten free all purpose flour. And you're set. And you have a good appetizer for your table, or it's a good hostess gift that you're going to somebody's house and you Ooh, can take with take you. some oysters. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Well, there you go. That's a good proper Mid-Atlantic Thanksgiving edition. And if you have a different recipe or you want to show us that you're making it, send us a picture. We would love to see it. Please. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. yeah. This week's retail therapy, we're keeping it all turkey. It's all turkey all the time this week. Okay, so we're going to do vintage turkey tableware, which, come on, everybody knows. There is so much vintage turkey tableware out there. You practically fall over it in the thrift shop. Okay, I had boxes marked in my parents' basement, Chrissy's Hope Chest, Chrissy's Hope Chest. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, you've told this story before. And within it, 
were all the vintage turkey. Really? Do tell. <laughs> like, what do you have? Like the turkey butter dish, the platters, the yeah. gravy boats, everything for the Thanksgiving table. And I'm thinking, does this mean I'm taking over Thanksgiving? And it kind of did. It, yeah, I'm sure it did. So the stuff has a special place in my heart because it was all put in there. But I wanted to tell this little story because everybody has to remember this when you were younger. If you're around our age, mm-hmm. the grocery stores would have the tableware and you would save the little stickers. Yeah. And then you would go collect the pieces for Thanksgiving table. It was like the 70s and 80s version of green stamps. Yeah. yeah. And you would go and you would get like the turkey platter mm-hmm. or the gravy bow. Right. And now that stuff is all super vintage. It is. Yeah. And super collectible. We're super vintage. No, we're not. There's so much out there, man. Oh, oh my God. So, there really is tons. You can go super, super expensive or you can go cheap but still really great vintage. One of the brands to look for, and they still have contemporary stuff, but classic 1990s Williams Sonoma. Yeah. They had some really nice turkey stuff. I have a glass turkey that's actually a cranberry sauce dish. Mm -hmm. That's Williams Sonoma. That's a treasure. I love that. You can also look for sets of china. Now, this is going to get pricey. Oh, yeah. But we're talking about like brown transfer wear. Right. Like Spode. There's a lot of that. There's a ton of it. Spode is a really pricey one. Royal Stafford. And then both Williams-Sonoma and Pottery Barn have a more contemporary set. Oh, yeah. They're still really nice. If you find a whole set of that, some of them are like turkeys and stags and pheasants. Yeah. Snag it. Oh, my God. Okay, look at this plate. (laughs) It's a top turkey and a top hat and a cape. That is so cool. It's from the 1990s? Who made it? Can we tell? Uh, Let's see. It doesn't say who made it. One of the easiest things to find, I mean, I feel like you trip over this in the thrift shop, Are the big platters with the turkeys on them. Yeah, and I always need multiple because in my house, Joe doesn't like turkey for Thanksgiving. So we have turkey, but he also makes his own like ham. My brother-in-law from Florida doesn't eat turkey either. He has ham too. Yes. Interesting. We we need two platters. Yeah, you always find those in the thrift stores. Yeah, tons of platters. And you can use them for whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't have to be just the meat on the table. Well, once there's something on it, the turkey's covered anyway. Yeah. They're very pretty. It's a bit more of a treasure hunt, but you know what are out there? Turkeys on a nest. Oh, yeah. For the turkey ladies out there, I mean, you don't have to just use it for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is where you originally think you're going to use your turkey wear. I always set the table for chicken wear for Thanksgiving, too. My goose on a nest might have to make a visit. Yeah, but there's so much stuff out here that's just gorgeous. And it's a lot of like the colonial time style, mm-hmm. you know, like you said, transfer wear, all that Early stuff. American looking stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There's definitely some like mid-century modern import porcelain. One other really neat thing to look for is just turkey statues or statuettes. Yes. Because they make a fantastic centerpiece on oh, your yeah. Thanksgiving table. I always pride myself on making a really pretty Thanksgiving table. I send Joe out because we have so many evergreens Mm -hmm. on the property. And I was like, I just need a branch. And he'll come in with like... I've seen how Joe cuts a branch. It's like half a tree. It's half a tree. (laughs) So I have evergreens. I have oranges. And then I try to bring out all my turkey wear that I have Uh and make really nice centerpieces. But it's fun to look at the stuff and there's so much stuff. I mean, if you don't want to venture out into a thrift shop or a yard sale, there's always Etsy or eBay. Yes. Something as small as turkey salt and pepper shakers and they do exist. I mean, if you're like, okay, I've collected a lot of chicken stuff. Now let me see what they have for my Thanksgiving table. Mm-hmm. You're going to be pleasantly surprised. Oh, yeah. yeah. In the amount of vintage turkey stuff And out it's there. often in browns and gold. It's very autumn. It would pair well with like, you know, yes. gorgeous jewel tones and oh um, yeah, and it's usually like linens. yeah, like the fruits and vegetables that are yep. representative of this time of the year. Yes, with it. so it's a fun thing to look up. If you have any, show us. We would love to see it. We would love to see your Thanksgiving tables. Tag us and we'll share. Tag us. We would love to see Thanksgiving tablescapes with turkeys. Okay, so should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we're back to chickens. Yay! We are going to revisit one of the most popular chickens in America, the Plymouth Rock. Yes, we are. Main topic, this is a listener request. When is it time to call the vet? Yes, that's a very important topic. It can be hard to know when to pull the trigger, yeah. Cracking the eggs, we're going to do my mini apple marzipan cakes. So good. Yeah. And we're going to finish up, because Thanksgiving's over, it's Christmas time, we're going to finish up with our favorite chicken Christmas ornaments of 2022. Okay, so happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We hope you have a wonderful holiday with your friends and family. 
and enjoy the time and just have a great day and a great weekend. And we're grateful for all of you. Yes. Thank you to every single one of you for listening. So what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens and have a happy Thanksgiving. Every day and kiss them too. Don't forget. We'll talk to you next week. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.